Welcome to a new edition of Are You Live? Tonight we have a very special guest all the way from Knoxville, right? Tennessee? That's right. James Lindsay, who's a recent guest with Helen Pluckrose on Unregistered. And that was probably the most popular, well-received, well-reviewed, most viewed episode, at least in this calendar year for Unregistered. Yeah, it got a no, lot right. of, got a, and it was long. It was two and a half hours, but people really listened to it. And I have seen many people online say that it was the best podcast of any kind they've seen in, in like a year or so. I've um, had similar feedback, actually. Yeah. About it. Extremely um, positive. And James gets all the credit. I don't think uh, so. Helen. Well, no, I, it's always Helen. I actually think it was, um, as we were saying before we turned on the, the recording here, I think it was a model of collaboration among people who disagree. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think because, you know, we had some agreement and some fundamental disagreements, big ones, but we talked for two and a half hours in a, not only a civil way, but a productive, interesting, creative way. Like it certainly, I was thinking hard the whole time. Um, and I was rethinking things as we were talking and have continued to rethink things since then. And I, there's a few things that I want to continue from that conversation that um, have been sticking in my head because I don't think I actually fully understand your points on a couple things in particular. So I wanted to, uh -oh. I wanted to, yeah, I mean like, so I wanted to let you air those again and I wanted to kind of think, because I'm not sure, I, I, I really didn't get it. So I want to make sure that I get your, one of your core critiques, which is maybe at the center of all this stuff. So for those who don't know, uh, James and his um, colleague, collaborator, Helen Pluckrose have been, I'd say, leading critics of postmodernism and social justice on college campuses and critical theory that's appearing on college campuses and in activism. And they've been, because of that, they've been associated with what's called the intellectual dark web. And James, you've been on the Rogan show, right? I was on Rogan, that's right. Yeah, and so, you know, and they also used to work with Peter Bogosian, who was very much a part of the intellectual dark web. Um, and the reason I had him on Unregistered, um, and the reason I think that it was such a good conversation in part, was that they, as far as I can tell, are about the only people in that world, the intellectual dark web, um, who are criticizing po what they call postmodernism, who've actually read the major texts in postmodernist um, theory and philosophy. And um, in fact, I think James is probably better read than I am in a lot of it. And it shows, I mean, you have a really nuanced, sophisticated, intelligent take on this thing that's been sort of just batted around like this empty ball, you know, by people who don't know, I clearly don't know much about it. And you and Helen agreed with me, I think that it's true that most of the leading, most famous critics of postmodernism really don't know what they're talking about. Um, so that's, that's kind of what we talked about in large part in the episode. And, um, but James has also become in recent days, I guess, a, a, a fairly uh, loud critic on Twitter um, of libertarianism. I should and point out that this isn't just a recent days phenomenon. It is a periodic phenomenon where I, I have been doing this for over 10 years and then they lash out at me and I'm like, ah, they're not worth it. And I stopped talking about them for another year or so or oh, two liber years. Libertarians, you mean? Yes. I grew up around libertarians. So I'm, I'm oh. rather familiar with them. And, and being that I, cool. if I had to pick a label, I'm a liberal, um, left leaning liberal traditional style, like John Stuart Mill, maybe. Yes. Um, I, uh, I have a lot of disagreements <laughs> with, with their, their political and social and economic philosophies. Awesome. So okay. I am, I, I'm a veteran of that extraordinarily frustrating uh, verbal conflict. Fantastic. I can't wait to get into that. I mean, I mean that because, uh, you know, I hang out with libertarians and I have for several years now mm -hmm. and they make up probably a majority of the audience of unregistered. Mm -hmm. um, but but the I, majority of my close friends in person as well. Yeah. And, um, and I love them and I agree with them on a lot of stuff mm -hmm. and on public policy, as I've said, if I were a congressperson, I would probably vote just like Ron Paul, pretty much, like 99% of the time. But that is not all of life, you know, and we have, a, <laughs> I think I know that I have some disagreements with libertarians or often I feel like they just sort of miss a lot of things that they could add to their worldview that might help in terms of the pursuit of liberty, in fact. Um, mm -hmm. But let's, um, what do you want to talk about first? Do you want to do the postmodernism stuff? Um, 
I mean, you know your people better than I do. Uh, yeah, let's do both. I think more people are excited. To, maybe people are more excited about this libertarian thing than I think they are, but um, I know that a lot of people are very excited to hear me prattle on about postmodernism these days. Let me, okay, let's do this. So there was one section in the episode um, in which you laid out a critique, a very lengthy critique of, I think, what I think, and many people think is sort of the foundational text of what we now call postmodernism proper, which is Thomas Kuhn's The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, right? Mm -hmm. And honestly, because I don't know the history of science the way that you do, you're trained in it in large part, um, I had trouble following your argument there. And I'm not sure I fully got it. In fact, I'm yeah, pretty I sure you. I didn't got it. I didn't get it. Um, right. So why don't we, why don't we just do that? Because that sure. I think goes at like so many of the big questions that people have about postmodernism and criticisms they have of people like me who defend it. So do you mind like laying out as you see it, Kuhn's argument and then your critique of it? Uh, yeah, I'll try to just summarize pretty quickly like I did on the podcast, but not okay. quite. I think I talked for 13 minutes straight or something <laughs> like that with, yeah. with no, I don't think I breathed. Wow. Um, <laughs> so long and short is that, that Kuhn ob observed that the, the science kind of proceeds according to this kind of disjointed sort of uh progression. You have, what, what do he call them? Paradigms. And uh, so you have these scientific paradigms where, where there's one dominant mode of thought, maybe it's uh, geocentrism. And then all of a sudden, after what he called a paradigm shift, there's another dominant mode of thought, a completely different model, mm -hmm. like uh, heliocentrism. So we've moved the earth from the center, geocentrism to uh, the sun at the center. And then at some point, so that that's actually talking about, you know, like celestial mechanics there. And that gets, you know, strengthened by Newton. Uh, Newton's laws allow Johannes Kepler to work out Kepler's laws of planetary motion. They figure out that the, the orbits aren't even circular. They're actually ellipses, da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. you, you can talk about, you know, the tremendous observational successes of Tycho Brahe, who's one of the more interesting historical figures in science. Hmm. Uh, if you don't know about him, his stories really in his death is are really worth looking up. He had a gold nose because he lost it in a duel. Whoa. Um, quite, quite a fun guy. Huh. Uh, died of a ruptured bladder because he was too polite to get up from the table huh. after drinking huge amounts of wine before the Duke. But he also wouldn't pee his pants and his bladder ruptured and he died. Um, <laughs> who is this? So, who are we talking about? Tycho Brahe. Can B someone, Lander, you are a H E. Oh, legendary yeah. figure gotcha. so he, he anyway he, he had all the observations that made it so that the kepler could verify his work and um so anyway we enter we enter into this kind of newtonian paradigm uh, the classical mechanical paradigm if you will and then kind of like the short story is dot 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 along comes einstein flips everything on its head and now we're in this einsteinian paradigm somewhere along the line we've now bumped into quantum mechanics so now we have both quantum and Einstein happening. You could say it's Bohr and Einstein happening kind of at the same time. They don't marry quite right. So there's going to have to be a paradigm shift at some point that deals with that on down the line. I don't know that Kuhn would have been up on those last things, but you have this idea anyway, that science we're talking here in terms of physics uh, progresses from one overarching model of thought, a paradigm of thought, and then hits a revolution a paradigm uh, shifting revolution in thought, and then it's in a different one. So everything that was true in the past is no longer seen as as correct. Right. And now there's an entire. It's it's like it's literally called a paradigm shift. There's an entirely new way to think about everything. Mm -hmm. And so that, of course, has been taken up by the postmodern thinkers, uh, Leotard very much in particular. To although Foucault's genealogies kind of parallel the same the mm -hmm. same thing, uh, to to say that well science was wrong then, then there was this massive change and everything was thought of differently, and then science was wrong again and then you know there was this massive change and then science was thought of differently, dot 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 and so the kind of take home message that I usually hear from postmodern thinkers and if I understand your argument correctly is that this is more than anything a gigantic call to epistemic humility 
to say that there's no way that we should be so arrogant as to believe that the science we have now is correct. Mm -hmm. And so we need to remain open-minded. We need to not put too much faith in science. We need to not fall into scientism, if you will. Um, this is very common, what I hear from, from the postmodern perspective off of Kuhn. So what I said on the podcast, and I still think, is that the nature of a scientific revolution or a paradigm shift is very specific. Uh, they don't happen out of nowhere. They happen because uh, the evidence that doesn't match with the prevailing paradigm keeps building up and building up and building up until finally somebody has the insight that kind of flips the script a little bit and allows all the pieces to fall into place. So we had before uh, Copernicus, we had the Ptolemaic model of planetary motion. It was Earth at the center. Everything moves in circular orbits around it. You have this observational problem called retrograde motion of uh, the outer planets. And so they go across the sky, then they slow down, then they stop and go backwards. I don't know if you know that planet comes from, I think, the Latin for wanderer. Mm -hmm. So it's a star that wanders across the sky. Oh, wow. And, and they don't just wander. They wander and then they kind of slow down and then they go backwards. Then they go back the other way. So they really look like they're kind of wandering like a drunk walk. And it turns out that the geocentric model can't explain that. And so the Ptolemaic model came up with this thing that's now kind of famous as like a, it's another paradigm uh, of, um, they're called epicycles. So rather than going around in a circle, the planets would go around in a circle and then each, they were actually like on little wheels and would go on little circles as they went around at a speed that would explain why they go backwards sometimes. Hmm. And so they kept working out what are the sizes of these epicycle circles and no matter how they fiddled with it, they could never quite get it to be right. It never quite matched the observations, especially like I was mentioning Brahe and his observations were, you know, insanely good for the day, which I guess would have been 15th or 16th century, uh, 16th century, I think. So extremely accurate observations. And so um, all this evidence is kind of building up that something's wrong. So they keep, they, they change the size of the, the epicycle circles. They, put an extra, you know, there's a, it's, it's going around on a circle, on a circle. So they add another circle. So it's going around on a circle, on a circle, on a bigger circle to try to figure out in the different speeds. And there's no overarching theoretical explanation for how or why any of this works. So you're starting to, you, you, you can get closer to accurate descriptions of the, the, the data, but you don't have a parsimonious theory that makes any sense anymore. It's impossible to explain if it's in that case why God would have put the planets on these complicated <laughs> sets of wheels. Right. Um, turns out if you just keep adding epicycle circles like that, as we now know from the Fourier transform, that you actually can model any movement whatsoever. <laughs> so they could have got there eventually, but you, you could have the planet draw out like a cursive rendition of your name that way or a, a perfect oh, wow. image of your face if you're willing to add enough circles and, and do enough <laughs> things. So that you don't really have an operative theory. Well, along comes this dude, Galileo. Galileo had, you know, he's famous for a lot of things, but the most important thing that he did was, besides getting arrested by the Catholic Church for doing this, uh, was to, to invent the telescope and to look out with the telescope and see things. And one of the things he saw was Jupiter. And you can actually, if you've ever taken a small telescope out, you can resolve the disk of Jupiter. But in addition, you can see what are now known as the Galilean moons, because Galileo could also see them. And the Galilean moons were a big, big problem for the geocentric model, which central thesis was everything goes around the earth. Right. So now you have a thing that's very obviously you can watch it if you are willing to take, you know, a couple of days of careful observation going around Jupiter. And so all of a sudden this flash of insight happens. So this is where the paradigm shift really begins. You have this problem, the data aren't being explained and then you have this flash of insight, wait, something goes around Jupiter, maybe there's a different model. Maybe the Earth is going around the sun rather than the sun around the Earth. You flip the thing over, you start working out, well, what would that have to look like? Newton has already done his calculus enough to where uh, Kepler is able to figure out laws of planetary motion. All these things start to fall into place. And the universal law of gravitation is the only thing you need to be able to explain basically all of it. And 
boom, now you're in a new paradigm. So what you had was this buildup of failures of observation that then forced people to start to doubt the previous paradigm to say that, you know, we were being too uh, hubristic in our, our understanding of what we thought was true about the world. Mm -hmm. But it isn't just some, you know, it's, it's often, I often hear it from critics of science that it's just almost like this arbitrary change as, mm -hmm. as opposed to stepping out of the dominant perspective. And of course, postmodernists should actually learn this because it would suit their argument better if they would step out of the dominant perspective and see it from a different perspective that changes things. But the thing is, is that that case is a little bit difficult to, to talk about. With, and I won't go into the details of the Einsteinian revolution once you really want me to, but the Einsteinian revolution's a little bit easier because all you have to do is reduce down to normal speeds when you go from from Newton to Einstein there's some huge change it's called relativity but all you have to do is drop down to normal speeds in an inertial frame of reference and all of a sudden you get Newton's laws Newton falls out of Einstein okay so the paradigm shift between Newton and Einstein really rec it it's a complete refinement it was basically saying that, that Newton had, had it really close. He just wasn't quite thinking about it the right way. So everything that was in Newtonian mechanics within the parameters that Newtonian mechanics can absorb is correct. But there are limitations on the, on, on the, the limits of, or there are limitations on the parameters of, of Newtonian mechanics of where its validity lasts. And it turns out to be that those are extremely high speed or extremely strong gravity situations. And so the paradigm shift there, again, it's, it's more subtle than this whole science was wrong. It was science, as, as you even said on the podcast, you know, people were doing good observation, they're tracking the planets, they're tracking the moon going around the earth, they're tracking the sun as it arches across the sky. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're, they're observing this. So people are doing really good observations and they're able to make predictions, but then there are places where the predictions don't work and everybody's hands kind of go up. And the paradigm shift allows a new way of thinking that stops your hands from going up. Say, oh, that's what's going on. And there were certain things when we had the Einsteinian revolution from Newtonian mechanics that just made no sense. Uh, I talked on the podcast, the most famous example, which means nobody knows anything about it, is the precession of the perihelion of Mercury which was very difficult to explain. And they were doing the same trick, right? So it was something within the existing paradigm must explain it. Maybe there's another planet. Maybe there's a planet that's always on the opposite side of the sun from the earth and its gravity is distorting the way Mercury moves, but Mercury's not moving the way it should move. And then Einstein comes along post 1916. And then you can say, oh no, it actually is that the sun's gravity is shifting the shape of space so much that Mercury has to move this way. Right. And, um, like I said, we're now in a, in a new place because we have relative, general relativity and quantum mechanics both that are somehow incompatible uh, at certain levels. But at the same time, they've both been the most highly examined and tested theories in the history of mankind, and neither one admits any known error to tremendous levels of, of statistical certainty, um, which isn't to say you know, absolute truth, of course. So my, my criticism of Kuhn, maybe I did talk for 13 minutes, is, is that it's not so much a criticism of Kuhn. I mean, he's writing a long time ago. It, it's a criticism of the way that he gets interpreted as, to, as if this paradigm shift is just this kind of like magical thing that happens where science was wrong and then all of a sudden somebody comes along with, mm -hmm, now there's a magical new idea mm -hmm. uh, and this magical new idea changes everything and now we're going to be in a completely different paradigm as if it's almost got this like flavor of arbitrariness to it. Yeah. Um, I really should have done the Einstein revolution because Einstein was following James Clerk Maxwell, who was doing classical electrodynamics. He's like the king of classical electrodynamics. Mm -hmm. And Maxwell stumbled upon by kind of accident and mathematics, purely mathematics, wasn't even doing observational science, that the speed of light should be a constant. And then Einstein's insight was actually merely to say, if the speed of light is a constant, why should it matter what reference frame you're in? So if I'm, you know, on a tr if I'm standing on the ground and I shine a light, it should go away from me at a certain speed. But if I'm on a train going really, really fast, you know, maybe half or most of the speed of light and I shine a light, if, if the speed of light is a constant, it has to be going the same speed for both observers. And if that's what happens, if, if that's reality, then what happens? And he worked out 
what would have to happen and it's called special relativity you just did the math on what had to happen so that was that was it but so you have this uh, you have this observation you, these observations are building up either things that conflict or that can't be explained or in this case with, with Maxwell's observation something that nobody had realized before which was that the speed of light must be a constant um, and when, and, and of course Maxwell didn't prove that, but other people had measured the speed of light and he had calculated the speed that should fall out of the electromagnetic uh, equations, electrodynamical equations um, that are called Maxwell's equations now, and saw that they were the same number. So he thought, hmm, maybe the speed of light is this number, but if so, it is a property of space, not something else. Therefore, it must be a constant. And so this, this actually led to, well, we, we have to think about something in a different way, right? So do you see what I'm saying when I say mm -hmm. that there's this arbitrariness mm -hmm. I often hear from postmodern mm -hmm. thinkers mm -hmm. where it's not at all arbitrary. Mm -hmm. it, okay. but it's part of the progression. And you can think of it like lots of ideas being connected by nodes one to another, and then all of a sudden something comes along and forces you to reconfigure how the nodes are connected. Mm -hmm. But a, a lot of them stay connected the same way. And then some of them have to be reconfigured around the, the shifted paradigm idea. Okay. So hopefully that clarifies, and I hope it helps you. Um, my mm -hmm. only issue is that when I hear postmodernists talk about it, they tend to, and when I say postmodernists, I actually mean intellectual postmodernists. I don't mean the critical social justice people who are pretending to be intellectuals and right. they don't know the first damn thing about science. Right. They, they tend to exaggerate uh, how, how much arbitrariness there is or what the process is that leads to these paradigm shifts. Yeah. Paradigm shifts are, are caused by like a massive weight of we need to change something and then somebody, Einstein, Galileo, so mm -hmm. whoever it happens to be, stumbles on the right thing that allows you to think in that new different way. Okay. So Tom has his hand raised, but I want to make sure I get this as right as I can. So, okay. That, first of all, that was a beautiful um, summary of the Copernican, Newtonian, and Einsteinian revolutions that brought us from thinking, all of us thinking, that the sun revolves around the earth to what we think now about all kinds of things, not just that, right? Like GPS, yeah, specifically. Yeah, yeah, all the things, right? So how far we've come, you know, from, so the three sort of connected revolutions in scientific thought. And your argument is that contrary to the way some POMO people talk, um, these were not just dramatic overnight ruptures and one minute everybody thinks that the sun revolves around the earth, which is kind of how I've talked. And the next right. minute everybody thinks the opposite, right? No, in fact, you know, they locked Galileo up for, for daring to say that something went around Jupiter. So yeah, right. That's right. So, okay. So the, these scientific revolutions you are saying are more gradual and, well, and right. Am I right? Am I right that they are also based on comparisons of models to evidence? Correct. Right. It's not just that like uh, Copernicus just woke up one morning and was like, you know what? Here's a groovier idea. Right. Right. Then correct. The, yeah. Okay. Um, so you do. So you agree with me and postmodernist types in saying that this does still call for what you call epistemic humility, meaning. Mm -hmm. Uh, if those guys were, so, if everybody was so wrong back then when they thought that the sun revolved around the earth, then how do we know that we're right about anything now? Right? That's one thing. That's one thing you agree with me on? Yes? Right. Okay. I, I mean, we have some disagreement. There's some fuzz in how do we know if we're right about anything now? Because there's degrees of rightness. Um, yeah. Okay. But let me, so let me, okay. So I think we're right. mostly in line so far. Okay. But and I didn't hear you say this, but I'm assuming this is what you think. <laughs> um, or maybe let, let me ask you, do, do you uh, assume or do you think um, that those revolutions have gotten science closer to truth and reality? I think, okay, so this is, touches right on the fuzz. The answer, the short answer is yes. <laughs> the longer yeah, okay. answer is right. that... It depends on what you mean by truth. Okay. 
Okay. And I don't mean that in like the, what does it, what do you mean by is? And as, by the way, just to be clear, when I said <laughs> Maxwell and Einstein about the time length here, yeah. um, Maxwell wrote his equations in 1860 and Einstein did special relativity in 1905. So we are talking 45, 50 years between the thing that ultimately agitated out that revolution and right. thought. So right. yes, they are very gradual. And they, and of course, people had been building up electrodynamics since, you know, Coulomb or something like that over 100, 150 years earlier than, than Maxwell. But, but you think, am I right, that the history of modern science, I guess, has been essentially generally progressive in that yes. it, in, in that it has moved progressively closer and closer toward understanding, ascertaining truth and reality. Yes. Again, it de yes. And it depends on what you mean by truth and ascertaining reality. It depends on what you mean by that. Okay. If, Cause like on the podcast, I said, if you mean by truth, being able to make statements about reality, upon which we can place bets and reliably win, it is beyond question that especially physics has gotten better. Um, just, just what would happen, what does happen when they first even, I think they even first launched uh, GPS satellites without the general relativity correction that was mm -hmm. necessary. And I mean, you go from being able to predict where people are with literally like centimeter accuracy to, um, them being hundreds of miles away from where they really are within a few minutes as the, as the, the predictive or the, 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 the measurements fall apart because general relativity is so pertinent okay. to how GPS works. So am I right that then that for you, the main piece of evidence that, that science has moved closer to reality is it's increasing predictive power. That's right. That's again, where we say, what do you mean by true? Because I, scientists yeah. in general don't take truth and haven't in a long time in the philosophy of science to mean an absolute statement about reality that is reflective of its true and absolute nature. They mean statements upon which if you place bets or make predictions are likely to be correct. So you're uh, saying, so you're saying that science is now better able to predict uh, nature's movements, right? I guess me mechanics than it was 500 years ago. Uh, certain sciences, absolutely. Probably or, all sciences. Or 100 years ago or 50 years ago. Like it all, it's that it's better than it always has been now at predicting, at predicting nature. Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's where I, I don't see it. I think that is just a statement of faith. Uh, but but uh, let's like even in physics, do you think that's a statement of faith? Because physics is as, about as hard of a science as you can get. Because if we're going to talk about like sociology, there's a lot of fuzz there and we can get into it, but physics. Well, so Ptolemy, Ptolemy predicted perfectly that the sun would rise over there and set over there mm -hmm. every day. He, it was perfect in his predictions. It was 100% right, accurate his, in his predictions. But his predictions about the <laughs> movements of Mars and retrograde were, were really bad. Well, so I know it's a kind of a totality of prediction, not like just one specific prediction. Okay. Okay. Right? Cool. All right. All right. Well, let's, let's let, I know there's people here chomping at the bit on this one. So let's, let's let them get into this. So Tom and then AJ, Tom, go ahead. Got it. Good. All right. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. What I'm missing and if I come at, it's interesting to listen to this because I've never heard postmodernism explained in terms of science. Mm. It was always in terms of Hegel or yeah. in terms of the French philosophy and this. Right. And what I'm missing in your explanation of it is that each paradigm is like total. It's the whole world. And so you're operating in this world and stuff doesn't start to work. Things don't work or they can't mm -hmm. find. So then you have this shift to a whole new total, mm -hmm. a whole new everything that includes that, hopefully. Like if you go to explain the solar system, it can still explain why it comes up in the east like we see it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just more inclusive. But uh, the idea that these totalizations are on some path to an absolute totalization, like Hegel's, that to me is what the postmodernists are balking at. 
Well, I mean, balk at that all they want because I don't know very many scientists who agree with that. Well, they're saying you go to a new totalization. Okay, it works for some stuff. It doesn't work for others. You go to another total, like I used to have a professor to say, take Euclid's geometry. Mm -hmm. You can build railroads with that. Mm -hmm. Take a non-Euclidean geometry, you can send somebody to the moon. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean the one explains the other better or that the two are on some kind of path to some universal geometry that takes in everything. Right, I yeah, I don't think they are. They want all these totalities to be particular. They're all particular, they all have their limits. And it's, it's a little more than just talking about it in terms of speculation, because we make inferences going from the totality back to things. You know, right. that that's the totality and reasoning that way, that these things are necessary, not just sufficient to make an explanation, but they're necessary, they're required. And that takes the whole totality to do that. But, so, am I? Okay. I'm not saying science is wrong. And maybe science itself has recovered from like the 30s when they were going to have a universal science. I don't know. But the project that having a universal science is what they're complaining about. Not that any particular science is wrong within the limits of what it deals with. Is that really a fair criticism of scientists? Um, I mean, historically, over the last several hundred years, I, I don't. I, I think I might agree with James on this. Like, I don't see. I would. I, mean, I would actually argue that um, the scientists probably, at least pre eighteen fifty, probably had attitudes like that. That their truths were true. Uh, for for everything like a cosmology, wasn't there, wasn't there a project? Yeah, more or less. Okay, to write universal science or bill. I still remember. In the 1930s is when when uh, both scientific and logical positivism were really on the rise, and so a uh, really pro uh, dominant. So actually, it, it makes sense that the, the postmodernists would be freaking out about this at the time that they did 20, 30 years later, <laughs> because. Um, that was, I mean, even the people who put that forward, like Bertrand Russell and so forth, decided to walk back from it later and say that it went too far to, to believe that, you know, you, we could just either create a formalism that would explain everything or that everything could be reduced to understanding it through observation. Uh, I mean, there was actually genuinely a lot of development in the philosophy of science through the 20th century that strongly took it away from philosophies frankly. It took science away from philosophy, where philosophy is very interested in, um, you know, necessary versus contingent truths and all of this stuff. Science is a little bit kind of dirtier and more pragmatic. And finally, the philosophy of science was just like, you know what, we're not going to do that. So the, the, the picture of the, 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 the philosophy of science that I actually think is the, the most descriptive wasn't even written down until 2012. It's a modification of something called instrumentalism, instrumentalism would have been one of the answers to positivism uh, in the philosophy of science that grew up outside of the postmodern tradition. Uh, instrumentalism was basically all we can know is what we measure in terms of scientific knowledge. Can you define, and can you define positivism also? Positivism in brief is the idea that uh, it's pretty close to scientism. It's the idea that um, everything knowable is knowable through science. Uh, that's at least within the scientific side of positivism. Logical positivism, which was more in the mathematics and, and philosophy side, was that every, everything can be reduced to like these symbolic formalisms, and then we can understand all knowledge and create kind of a grand unified theory of everything. Mm. Um, Bertrand Russell spent thousands of pages proving that one plus one equals two, going back to literally their simplest first possible principles without ever just saying this is what one is. And if we put another one there, then we call that two and we're done with it. Those are definitions. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, there was this huge movement. It was very popular in certain branches of analytic philosophy in the thirties. Uh, and of course, again, we're seeing the analytic versus continental philosophy war here when we talk about postmodernism. Yeah. that was trying to, trying to do that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So certainly, you know, I'm content to, to say that a lot changed uh, over the 20th century with regard to the philosophy of science. It, but um, that's a sort of, you know, place that we, we catch on in these conversations a lot is to kind of hold up science as like this monolith in space and time. <laughs> it's, mm -hmm. you know, physics is different than chemistry. That's sort of a mm -hmm. spatial dimension. And so they have different rules, different parameters. Uh, Sean Carroll's actually quite good at discussing these things. 
mm-hmm. um, orders of complexity and all of this business. And then there's also the fact that people have thought not just science itself, done science itself differently, but thought about science and thought about how to do science differently. And I think that's also evolved in a progressive direction uh, and saw major leaps after the failures of positivism. Uh, and one of the kind of strands that came out of that is a postmodern view of science um, that I personally don't think has been terribly informative to science. Um, mm-hmm. While Kuhn's observations certainly were, Kuhn kind of becomes like a seed for both of those those directions of thought. So the the view that I hold now was put forth by um, Stephen Hawking and his Caltech collaborator, uh, Leonard Mladeno. And I know people looked for how to spell that after our podcast. And it's M-L is the first two letters, M-L-O-D-I-N-O-W or something like that. Um, I met Leonard at one point, it was nice. Uh, so anyway, they put out this idea called model dependent realism, which basically says that the paradigm lives in the model and we should have realists, we should be realists, we should think that reality is out there, we should believe that the model's telling us something about reality, but we shouldn't be so epistemically arrogant to believe that the, the model is actually a true in the philosophical hard sense statement about reality. Yeah. Uh, the model is a social construction. Boom. <laughs> Great. <laughs> I'll go along with that. <laughs> yeah, me too. We're all getting along now. Good. Okay. Uh, but I still think we have some disagreement. All right. Um, AJ, I know AJ has a lot to say here. Yeah, hopefully. So I have, I had um, two things that I thought of while you were um, talking. Rambling. Thomas Coons. No. And <laughs> go ahead, AJ. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, no, you're good. I was, I was making fun of James. Great. Great. Um, yeah, so I had two thoughts while you were um, talking, responding to the Coons uh, piece. And, and mm-hmm. um, the first one is kind of smaller, unimportant, is um, to the extent that you can, we can map out um, science's um, increasing predictive power. Um, what do you, what, what do you, would you think of, um, what do you think the likelihood is that we're just approaching a local maxima rather than a global one? <sighs> oh, oh, me, wait, wait, explain that for us yeah. morons. Yeah. yeah. So like, um, I, it seems like we're getting closer to some sort of peak or truth, but um, it's not clear if it is like the highest uh, hill. So maybe this is, we're moving in the direction of truth, uh, but then we actually get more predictive mm. after after a valley or, or some such. Right. Okay. So, um, okay. So are you saying that, you know, what's the likelihood that we're going to have to basically move backwards to move forwards? I don't, I, I can't imagine sense. we would, but, or probably leap from hill to hill is more likely, or like, I would, I would say it seems like, um, if a, if a, w- would you say it is valid to say that if a, um, if a theory like, um, like Newtonian mechanics is fully subsumed by um, Einsteinian mechanics, that's like moving up the hill. Whereas uh-huh. if it has to be toppled, it's more like leaping from one hill. Sure, to sure, 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 sure. Yeah. Um, you know, it's actually really difficult because the nature of the disagreement between quantum mechanics and uh, general relativity is not the same. We're not mm-hmm. seeing observations that are coming out wrong, mm-hmm. which is you know what starts to build up the weight of these paradigm shifts. We're actually seeing a situation in which both quantum mechanics and general relativity are known to be fundamentally incompatible in certain ways, at least mathematically. And then there's no uh, unified theory that can put them together anyway. And then every test confirms them further. It, you know, there's not any place where you, anybody's like, uh, it's not quite getting that thing right. It's just that they don't mix. Mm-hmm. And so this is fundamentally different. Um, mm-hmm. So it is entirely possible that there's going to have to be some, that it, some paradigm shift that if one comes along that marries the two of them or that, that contextualizes. It's better to say that contextualizes both of them differently such that they are understood as part of a larger whole uh, may have to be such a jump. Um, or yeah, I guess it's like uh, there is sort of scientific projects on two hills, right? Both and it, which could be local maxima. And we yeah we in, in the fact that we are so close to or we are up, are up on something like local maxima makes it very difficult to see 
how we're going to to get to the next thing, right? Because right. yeah, so I I mean that's entirely possible. I'll even go further with this, and maybe um, this will be interesting to you. I have had an annoying habit of going around and asking physicists when I get the chance. They have to be kind of high level physicists because most of them just brush me off like I'm an annoying child when I ask this. <laughs> what do we do when because there are there are limits to observation. There are probably anyway limits to observation. And if we really get down to it, given things like the Planck length and so on, there may be fundamental limits to observational acuity in the, the universe. And I said, what would we do? The question is, what would we do if we had two competing scientific theories, say physical theories, that disagree fundamentally and yet are equally well predicted by the maximum possible observable evidence, the maximum possible number of decimal points mm -hmm. as, as experimental physicists like to talk about it. How do we choose between them? And I've never got a good answer to that question. I have yet to get a good answer. So we have, the idea would be with mo within model dependent reality, what do we do if we have two models that are equally good descriptors and predictors of reality that are fundamentally different from one another, but incompatible? how do we choose between them? And I'm talking about they are equally good predictors of reality to the maximum possible observational acuity that, that the universe allows. Not even that humans can achieve currently, but ever. Because it's a, and, and nobody, nobody I've ever run into has an answer. And usually I get, we'll never get there. It doesn't matter. Yeah. So that actually answers the bigger question in general, though, is that scientists don't give a shit about this. They so, do not give for sure, for sure, for sure. I'm gonna call I'm gonna call time out just for a second here. AJ, we'll come back to you in a second. Yep. So we're gonna go to private session right now. So if you are watching this on YouTube and you wanna be participate in RU Lives in the future, join renegadeuniversity.com at any level, and you can do that by clicking the link below. And we're going to private session now. <laughs>